thrilled at what you're doing in the earth. Thank you for the salvation we're watching happen before our eyes. Lord, truly nothing is too impossible for thee. Lord, this night we ask you, O God, as we begin to culminate this series, Lord, to remind us, O God, to continue to stand in the war, knowing that you have given us the victory, that you are the guarantee of our victory. And Lord, this night we ask you to illuminate our minds, our hearts, our thoughts, and cause everything concerning our innermost being, O God, become conformed to the image and the character of your character and nature, dear Jesus. Lord Jesus, you are our high priest. There is nothing we can do for ourselves. We are utterly helpless and totally dependent upon thee. And, O God, open, O God, our hearts tonight and give us, O God, that work of circumcision that we desire, Lord. We don't want to be brought to the place, O God, where it's time to give birth and not have the strength, O God, to give birth. But, Lord, make us, O God, complete in yourself. And, Jesus, we commit this service to you. We commit these people to you. And, Lord, not only this service, but also, O God, the one with Brother Fernando out for this one. And, O God, be glorified this full night. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen, please. Well, this is the final tape. This is tape number 18. We did uh, 16 and 17 this morning. And we're, we're beginning to close out what we've learned so far in these six weeks about taking the land that God has given us to possess. I think we've learned a lot, a lot of amazing things. Um, I think one of the things that impressed me the most was when I discovered that Jesus is always with us to strengthen us, is that right, for warfare. And I began to learn in this series because I didn't know that when I began to teach this, but I was looking at other things I knew about in those chapters, but I was amazed to discover it's all over the Word of God. Amen? So we don't have to ever worry, wondering, as long as we're doing the things we know that's pleasing in His sight, if we're going to overcome. The answer is absolutely we're going to overcome. Because He will cause us to overcome. And He's the guarantee of the victory. Amen? Amen. And He's given us that victory. We're, we're partakers of His nature. The Bible says as long as we see ourselves with the promises of God, Peter said very clearly that we have been made partakers, partakers of God's nature. And folks, that's an awesome thought. I, it amazes me to think about that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and if I accept in faith what the Bible says concerning him and what he has provided for me on the cross, that I am made a partner in God's nature. That is awesome, in God's nature. Amen? Amen. And so let's get into the word of God tonight. And we saw this morning, because they weren't here, the tapes are ready, by the way, that Jesus crushes everything under his feet that will not, first of all, believe him, that walks in fear, that begin to go after other things. They trust in money, they trust in their jobs, they trust in their personality, they trust in themselves. They're, they're crushed under his feet. And if our faith is in anything else outside the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a mixture and God will reject us. Amen? We also saw he tramples under his feet everything and everyone that will not accept him and that will not follow him. And all that will follow anything else or trust any other strength or power that gets trampled under his feet. Now, if you want to hear this morning, we begin to look and begin to allow the word of God to magnify and to amplify a statement, a passage of scripture found in the 19th chapter of Revelation, where the Lord said to us very clearly, he said, I saw the heavens open, and I saw him set up on the white horse, and he said, in righteousness, he judges, and he also wages war. But then the thing that amazed me was, he was clothed in a robe, a vesture, that had been dipped in blood. And I remember for years, I thought it was talking about part of the proof that he had died for us and that we were looking at his blood. But no, no. We saw very clearly this morning by the word of God that that blood that we were looking at, in fact, just to tie it in for you that weren't here, I think the thing that amazed me the most was when Isaiah, who had seen the Lord of glory, saw him. In a revelation, or in a vision. And he wondered, who is this that's coming, he said, from Edom and from Basra. And he says to him, why are your garments red, stained? And that word there is, is literally crimson. What, 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 what's that on your garment? And he says, I have been trodden the winepress. We saw very clear this morning that winepress was none other than the wrath of God. And so let's go back this right quickly. Let's go back to the book of Revelation. I'm going to take it from another aspect that we didn't do this morning. And let's look at the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation because I just want to make sure that we understand that if we don't take the land, we get trampled under his feet. We also saw this morning why the Bible says continuously that his feet is like burnished bronze or brass. And remember, what's the symbol for brass? Judgment, is that right? So when we feel the demon powers oppressing us, or feel ourselves attacked by evil spirits, we are literally being placed under his feet to be destroyed. 
and the purpose of what's being placed there, it's like it says in the book of Job, is that we cry out and say, Lord, deliver us from this place. Deliver us from this condition. Are you listening to me? And so many times we hear about people saying over and over, oh, I just can't seem to overcome. I'm, I, and, and they find them just, just, just totally engrossed and wrapped in everything you can think of that's despicable, even though they're hearing this type of message. Stop and think about it. They don't realize it, but they're candidates for the feet of Jesus to literally crush them like the, the uh, grape treader crushes grapes. Well, let me show you this. In the 14th chapter, because we didn't cover this this morning, and we'll stop by the 19th chapter just a little bit. We see here very clearly, he says in verse 18, another angel who has the power of a fire came out from the altar and cried out or called out with a loud voice to him where the sharp sickle saying, put in your sharp sickle, gather the cluster from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. Are ripe. Then the angel swung his sickle to the earth, gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth Notice these people are earthly. And the Bible says very clearly in another place, that vine that's attached to the earth, in the God's eyes, is exactly the same to him as Solomon and Gomorrah. And through them, notice way through these grapes, and these are human lives. This angel is not gathering grapes. This is all symbolic for lives. Fruit, the wrong kind of fruit. And he says, and he threw them into the great wine press, don't miss this, of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of two hundred miles. Is that in your Bible? So we're seeing a time of great wrath that God is preparing for this earth. Amen. Into the nineteenth chapter, let's look at this. Who's treading these grapes of these people's lives? The eleventh verse. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and he wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems, which means he's conquered everything. And he has a name written upon him, which no one knows except himself. And he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And we saw clear this morning that blood is the life. He that eternal life is pressed out of him. No chance for salvation. And his name is called the word of God. And in verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he might smite the nation. I mean destroy the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God. So now we know who the treader of these great are. It's none other than Lord Jesus Christ. And what the Lord is doing to us is showing us the other side of Jesus. Yes, he's compassionate. Oh, what tender mercies. Yes, he died for us, gave his life willingly for us. But there's a side of him. If we reject that which he has done for us, we get trampled under his feet. Amen? And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Let's look again at Isaiah 63. Let's see it from there. Now, we know now what he's talking about when he says, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Amen? Remember again that Esau had the same father that Jacob had. Jacob was saved. Esau was eternally lost and doomed. Amen? He sold his soul. The Bible tells us much about that, about how can we escape God's judgment if we too neglect so great a salvation. Amen? So here comes Isaiah. Now, I want you to see the same. The last time that I know of that he saw the Lord, he really brings it into Scripture, and I don't know everything between uh, that third chapter of Isaiah, I'm just going to say the sixth chapter of Isaiah and this chapter, but I know when he first saw the Lord, he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And it's the, the, the robe of his that's filling the temple. Is that right? The train is filling the temple. His robe. He saw the Lord of glory. Magnified, glorified, exalted in power and might. All strength. Such, such, uh, such magnificence. Revelation described in the same way. John says, I saw him shining in his strength like the sun. But this time when he sees the Lord. Look what he sees. He doesn't even recognize it. It's almost like John the Baptist. Not John the Baptist. John the Revelator. When he saw the Lord, it wasn't the same Lord that he had laid his head on his bosom. He was awestruck by the glory and the brilliance. Isaiah is struck, awestruck by how he looks this time he sees him. And he says, who is this that comes from Edom? We know the word for Edom is the word Esau. 
with garments. The numerical sign says of glowing colors. It literally says of crimson colors. Blood stained all over him. Glowing colors from Basra. He knew where he was coming from. This one, he's asking, who is this? Who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. Well, Jesus answers it. He says, who is this? And the Lord says, it's I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And so once he identified himself to Isaiah, Isaiah goes into dialogue with the Lord of glory. And he says, why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? This is why we see them with this robe stick dipped in blood. As I said this morning, I remember when you go to Italy, you see that they have the women, they're barefooted, and usually they will wear shorts underneath their dresses because when they're treading out the grace, they're doing this with their feet. They're doing this with their feet, and if their dress is touched, then it becomes the grape juice just spatter all over them. And so they hold their dress real high, and they're just dancing real fast, real fast. So God is saying to us, that's what's planned for all of us that continue in our rebellion, in our ways of iniquity. Amen? So he says, and so Jesus answers him. He says, I have trodden the wine trough alone. And from the peoples, there was no man with me, which means it was my total judgment. I also trod them in my anger, which means this is God's anger we're looking at, and trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, this is revenge, vengeance. And my year of redemption has come, and I looked, and there was no one to help, and I was astonished that there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath upheld me, and I trod down the peoples, in my anger, and made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. That's eternal life. Amen? So all through the scripture, we begin this morning by looking at Psalms 110. We went all the way into Matthew, and, and excuse me, uh, Luke, and also uh, into Hebrews. We saw in two places. It kept talking about enemies to be placed under the feet of Jesus. When we get to close out this morning with James 4.4, anyone who makes himself a friend of this world, he called him an adulteress has made himself an enemy of God. Amen? Amen? So they're destined for his feet. And we begin to look and begin to realize that what we're looking at was all symbolic. Because God said, I gave you the land to go possess it. And so what we're looking at are people who did the very same thing they did over there in the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14. Go in and spot the land. I've given you the land. Take possession of the land. And they say, we're not going to do it. God has said the same thing to us. I've given you my great salvation. I've called you more than conquerors. Stand. We've done everything to do. Stand against the powers of hell. Take every thought captive. And we've got people still saying, I feel so depressed. You can counsel them and counsel them and counsel them and counsel them. It seems to do no good. You can talk until your tongue falls out of your mouth. They're destined for the feet of the Lord. They don't wake up. Amen. And so we're going to realize what we're looking at was all symbolic. And Jeremiah. Oh, what a wonderful book, Lamentations. It's written as if it's not even attached to the writings of Jeremiah, yet it's written by Jeremiah. It was something so awful that he saw. He began to write it under such grief. It was written to, with the deepest type of mourning and groaning you could think about because he was watching God destroy the people of God in the house of God who had continued to live their lives in unbelief, who would not take a land because of fear and all kind of other excuses. And so he began to see, he saw just destruction everywhere. And that brings us up to tonight, because we begin to see how Jesus treated his enemies. We saw it in Jeremiah, we saw it all through Lamentation, we saw it in James, we saw it also in Micah. So I want to begin tonight about what we need to possess the land. We just close this out. To possess the land that's already given to us, the number one thing we need is endurance. And we're going to see over and over that only the overcomers possess the land. Is that right? They overcome, they're overcomers of all. And we begin to see that part of this character, the nature of Jesus, is he overcame the world. And if he's truly in us, if we're joined to him, we can't help but overcome this world. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. So go and say, he overcame the world and all his tribulations. And then he said to us, I'll give you the same requirement. He said, but be of good cheer. That means that all the time in this warfare, he said, because I've already overcome the world. And he's part of us. He's ahead of us. Amen? Mm -hmm. Let's go to 1 John tonight. 
First John, the second chapter. Let's look at verses 12 through 14. First John 2, verses 12 through 14. Ready? Verse 12. He says, I'm writing to you, little children. It's good to be a little child. Jesus said, you said to become like a little child and converted. You won't see the kingdom of heaven. He didn't tell this to little kids. He told this to grown men that was his disciples. They followed him for three and a half years. And he still said to them, you need to become converted. Become as a little child. That means take God in his word. In just blind trust. Because of a heart devoted to love. So he says, I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have done what? Overcome the evil one. Notice the characteristic, overcomers. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Excuse me, verse 14. I've written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you're strong. And the word of God abides in you. As we said to you earlier, the word abide means that you're practicing what you know the word says to do. It is impossible for you to claim that you abide in Jesus because you claim that you're saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and you speak in tongues and you have revelation knowledge. If you're not practicing the word of God, then let me say something to you. God sees it as if you are not abiding in the word and the word is not abiding in you. The Bible says in 1 Peter very clearly that we will save and born again by the word of God, by the living and abiding word of God. We still look all for the terms of abiding. It means to cling to. Is that right? It means that we're practicers and doers of the word of God. But that's what he's talking about. He says, you young men are strong and the word of God abides in you, which means they're walking in all the light they've ever been, they've ever been subjected to. And he says, and you have overcome the evil one. That's how we overcome, by obedience. Being doers of the word of God, isn't it? Well, First John, the third chapter, First John, chapter 3, I want to see this again about the one that abides in him. He says this very clearly in 1 John 3, the sixth verse. No one who abides in him, what's that word? Sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Are those words also in your Bible? Verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot see sin because he's born of God. And now he tells us something, a yardstick. He says, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness, that means habitually, is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Amen? Well, we begin to see here very clearly, all through John's writing, he talks much about overcoming. Look what it says in John the 16th chapter, please. The Gospel John. The Gospel John, chapter 16. And Jesus is a warning from him. He says in John 16, 33, let's read at verse 32. He said, Behold, an hour is coming, and has already come, for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone, and get on my own alone, because the Father is with me. These things I've spoken to you, that in me, that if you're abiding in him, you may have peace. That means your whole, no matter what you're going through, you're not looking at what you're going through, your hope is in Christ. And you have peace because you know that you're in him. He said, in the world we have tribulation, which he's telling us, as long as we're in the world, we're going to have tribulation. He said, but you take courage. That means become strong. The same thing he told, the Lord told Joshua. Same thing he told Moses. He says, you take courage. I have overcome the world. Amen? Amen. That means he possessed his land, if you want to call it that. Amen? Amen. Well, look, let's look at our tribulation, the 13th chapter of Revelation. What is our tribulation? What is this tribulation we have in the world? Revelation 13, verse 7. It was given to him, talking about Satan. It was given to him 
to make war with the saints and to overcome them. There's two that's out to overcome. We're out to overcome Satan in this world, in our own selves, and Satan's out to overcome us, to make us doubt the word of God that we hear. Isn't that amazing? I've said too many times before, I've seen people that can hear the word of God, and I mean, they can be so brilliant, just raised up, and oh, praise God, I'm saying the word of God. They can be walking out the door, and one demonic thought can come in something like, but you always mess up, and I mean they are thrown right back into the pit that have been overcome by the enemy. And we know that when we hear the word of God, we're going to be tested. The Bible told us that, didn't it? So it was given here to make war with the saints and to overcome them. An authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. So that's the tribulation that we have in this world. The war that we have with Satan. Amen? Again, the 12th chapter. Same thing, the 17th verse. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. Who to make war with? Who keep the commandments of God and they hold or cling to the testimony of Jesus. That means your body in the word of God to please Jesus. So he makes war with us. But God tells us, don't put our eyes on the war or on the enemy, to keep our eyes on him. Running the race that's set before us. Casting. Is that what the Bible says? Putting our eyes on Jesus. He says, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Well, let's look at our overcoming. In Revelation, the 12th chapter, here's how we overcome and possess the land. The 11th verse. And they overcame him. Notice the word overcome again. Every time you see the word overcome, remember, it means you took possession of the land. And I'm going to say this to you. You cannot overcome or take possession of the land unless you're totally dedicated to total obedience to all you know that God said for you to do. One thing he said to do was, meditate on my word day and night. Let not this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Is that right? And they overcame him. That's the one that he was given the power to wage war with them. How did he overcome him? Because of the blood of the Lamb, they put all their faith in what Jesus had done and not in their own ability. And because of the word of their testimony, that means they stood in the word of God. Satan, you can't overcome me. I've been given the victory. I've been purchased by him. I'm purchased in his blood. They overcame and took possession of their land. And they did not love their life. That means their carnal nature. That part of fallen man that tries to rule all of us. They hated that life. They hated that life of carnality. They hated the witness that was in their flesh. Even unto death. The life of fallen man. Which is the image and the character of Satan. The Bible says you're overcame. Can you say amen to that? In 1 John 5, one more place. Let's look at our overcoming. 1 John 5. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. Were you born of God? Talk to me. Were you born of God? Yeah. I want you to see this scripture. It's going to blow your mind. If you know that you are born of God, then you should have, you should let it trap on your feet tonight. All demon spirits, all guilt, all spirits of guilt and condemnation, all demons of insecurity, all demons of fear and dread, all demons of self-pity, all demons that will come against you if you really know that you are born of God. Because 1 John 5 says to me very clearly in verse 4, for whatever is born of God, what does he do? Overcome Overcomes the world. the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Every time you see the word tonight overcome, remember it means you took possession of the land. Amen? And then he goes on to say, and who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Are those words also in your Bible? Amen. Now, in 1 Peter, I quoted it earlier, but I want you to look at it tonight because we're closing this out. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, the Bible talks about when we were born again. And the Bible says, whatever is born of God overcomes. Is that right? Say with me. I am an overcomer. I am an overcomer. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of God. Look what it says here in 1 Peter, the first chapter. And let's look again at verses 23 through verses 25. God says, for you have been born again out of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. Can I tell you something? The word that Satan spoke to Adam and Eve was perishable. They were born again by the word of Satan until Jesus came and overcame Satan. Is that right? Yes. He said, you weren't born of just words that's, that's, that's perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living, and here's again, abiding word of God. For all flesh is grass, which means don't put your faith in your flesh. There's nothing good in my flesh. There's nothing good in your flesh. Amen? He says, flesh is like grass. 
and all its glory like a flower of grass. Folks, any lawnmower can cut grass down. Did you know that? You can buy a child, a little child's lawnmower. He can even cut it down. The grass withers. It means it loses its strength. The flower, the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. How were we born again? Because the word was preached to us. We said, I'm studying on the word. Am I going by what my flesh fails? And these were the overcomers. And what's ever born of God overcomes. And I'm determined to overcome. Amen? Amen. So that's how we're born again. Now, I want to point some things out because there were some things we saw very clearly as we begin to open up this course. I don't want us to ever forget these things. We saw clearly that once we enter the war, we go from fight to victory on the more fights and more victories over the enemy. We saw that. Is that right? We also saw when once we get into the war, we don't stop and rest and say, well, I've been fighting for so long. I need to get some rest. I need to do something to make my flesh feel good. No, no. That's a path of destruction. That's a path of, path of compromise to the enemy. Let's go back to Joshua, the 11th chapter. And let's look at one of the lessons that we learned that I feel like was probably one of the most important lessons in possessing our land. Joshua, chapter 11. And let's look again at verses 8 through verses 19. Joshua 11, verses 8 through verses 19. Say with me. God has given me the victory. God has given me the victory. See, it's time to begin to believe that, isn't it? Let's begin, please, at verse 8. And Joshua and all the people of what? There is again war with him. Came upon them suddenly by the waters of Merom and attacked them. See, God wants a people that will attack the enemy, not always waiting for the enemy to attack them. Joshua 11. Yeah, first. No. Verse 7. I'm I was in verse 7. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel. Why? Because he attacked the enemy. They took the land so that they defeated them and pursued them as far as a great Sidon and Misrephah, Ma'am, and the valley of Misrephah to the east. And they struck them until no survivor was left of them. Well, did they stop and rest? No. And Joshua did them as the Lord had told him. He hamstringed their horses, burned their chariots with fire. And then Joshua turned back at that time and captured Hazel. Notice he goes back from one battle to one battle. One battle in victory to another battle in victory. And struck his king with a sword, for Hazel formerly was the head of all these kingdoms. And they struck every person who was in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was no one left who prayed, and he burned Hazel with fire. Then Joshua captured all the sins of these kings and all their kings, and struck them with the edge of the sword, and utterly destroyed them, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. However, Israel did not burn any city that stood on their mounds except Hazel alone, which Joshua burned. And they put all the spoil of these cities and the cattle, the sons of Israel took as their plunder, but they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. They, when they get in the war, they fight until they're destroyed. They don't stop striking with the sword. The sword is the word of God. Is that right? They left no one who breathed. That means have any life in them to come against them. You strike every demon spirit that still has life in it against your flesh until it's destroyed. They left no one who breathed. Just as Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone. Notice it's done by obedience. Of all, A-L-L, the Lord had commanded Moses. Amen? So we see again, we begin to read this chapter, that from now on we begin to see that sometimes this war is a long time, but you keep enduring. You need endurance. Amen? 16, and Joshua took all that land, the hill country, that means you fight them in the, in the heavenly places, all the negative, sometimes you're in dry places. You don't let the dry places stop you from fighting. You keep on striking with the edge of the sword. All the land of Goshen, the low land, that means maybe you're in a pit. Low land, you're in a pit. Don't let that pit stop you from fighting. You don't say, well, I better quit because I feel so bad. No, he said, you keep enduring. The ones that endure to the end shall be saved. Enduring what? Enduring in warfare. Striking with the edge of the sword until the enemy is totally annihilated. The Arabah, that's a desert place. The hill country of Israel in this low land. The Mount Halak that raises above Syria, even as far as Belgad in the valley of Lebanon at the foot of Mount Hermon. They captured all their kings, struck them down, and put them to death. Joshua waged 
waged war a long time with these kings. Did he stop because he was, it was a long time? No. There was a city which made peace with the sons of Israel, except the Hobbites living in Gibeon, and they took all, them all, in battle. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So you don't stop and rest until the enemy is totally wiped out. Doesn't matter if you're in a high place. Oh, glory to God, I feel so good. I feel like I got some victory. Hallelujah. I think I delivered. You don't stop fighting until you know the end is totally destroyed. Then you come to that dry place. Oh, I feel like I'm just in such dryness. You don't stop fighting with the edge of the sword. Or maybe you're plunged down into a pit. You don't stop fighting with the edge of the sword. Amen. We don't go by what we feel. We go by what the word of God says because we live by mind to be an overcomers and endurers like he told us to be. Amen. Amen. Well, Let's begin to look at something else we saw. We also saw something else. We saw that God is with us to deliver us, to save us. You see, when Jesus said, I'll never leave you forsake you, he was saying, I'm with you to deliver you, to fight for you, to save you, to strengthen you for the battle. See, we've been saying, I don't feel Jesus. He said, he didn't tell us what Bible we feel, but just live by faith, but what the word of God says. God is faithful and true, Amen. Amen. Well, let's begin to see this in the book of Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter. You can always remember this. If you can remember 11 come 11, you can always remember it's in Joshua 11, Deuteronomy 11. Amen? The 11th chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 24 and verses 25. When does God fight for us? He doesn't fight for you, folks. Do you rise up against that power in your life is out to destroy you. Then God fights for you. When you attack, he attacks. It's not God attacking and you attacking. You attack and he attacks and he does all the mopping up. That's what it says. Every place, you remember 1124, on which the sole of your foot shall tread. Well, suppose you don't feel like treading, you don't get that place. Every border shall be from the wilderness, excuse me, your border shall be from the wilderness to Lebanon and from the river, the river Euphrates as far as the western sea. You take everything that God told you to take. You tell on every promise that God's ever given to you. But the most important thing is every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. God has already decreed. Verse 25. Here's what he says. It's this promise. There shall no man, circle no man and put no obstacle, no barrier, no imprisonment. Be able to stand before you. The Lord your God will in the dread of you and the fear of you on all the land on which you got to do it first. You set foot. As he has spoken to you. So the moment you come up against the thing in your life, God whose faith his word sends his terror and his fear on you. That's why when God talks about how he hates the fearful and how they're abominable, because as I said before, as we learned in the course, two cowards. The demon's afraid of you and you're afraid of the demons. Because once you came against them, God caused his fear to come on them. We never saw it, but God's going to take me at my word. So we have to set foot, amen? We also saw something else. Well, suppose we're just slow for it. Well, Lord, you know, I'm trying to fight this thing in my life. It's had me for such a long time. and I'll fight again next week, Lord. I just can't fight anymore. I just got to give in to it this time to get some rest. Go to Numbers, please. Let's not forget these truths. Numbers 33. Let's look at verse 53 through 56. Numbers 33. Verse 53. 56. You shall take possession of the land. God's always said that. And live in it. For I have given the land to you to possess it. I'm going to say it again. The land that God gave him to possess was full of demon spirits, giants. We know that. Is that right? And you shall inherit the land by lot according to your families. The Lord shall you shall give more inheritance, and to the smaller you shall give less inheritance. What that means? He that has much, God gives more to him. Is that right? Whatever the lot fails to anyone, falls to anyone, that shall be his. You shall inherit according to the tribe of your family. But, if, two stop signs, back to back, 
you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes, put out your spiritual vision. And as thorns in your side, weaken you, cripple you, handicap you, and they shall trouble you in the land in which you live. If that's not enough, look at verse 56. And it shall come about that as I plan to do to them, what did God plan to do to them? Travel them under his feet. God says, so I will do to you. It's overcomer or nothing at all. Now, let me ask you again. Is that 56 verse in your Bible? Does God say in 55, you let these dean things in your life and don't drive them out? If you'll do to us, we plan to do these powers of hell? Let me show you, it's the overcomer. Go to, back to the book of Revelation, please. Back to the book of Revelation. And let's look again at what the Lord says to us. The second chapter. And let's look at verse 7. He's talking about us possessing the land, and I want to say it again for the sake of us closing this out. We begin by looking at the word for land. The word is Korea. This word number 7130. Let me check to be sure that's right, but I'm sure it is. I've said it so many times. Yes, 7130. It's translated land, but the literal translation is inward parts, the body, the bosom, the inside feelings, the heart, the entrails, our inner thoughts, our inward thoughts, inward feelings within or within the land. And the word entrails is the total depth of our inner life. Entrails means wholeheartedness, totally dedicated to God. And God never changes command throughout all the time. We said this course is six weeks. Possess your land. Possess the land. And Moses repeated this, this word to Joshua and to all the river continuously. Go in, take possession of the land. God has given us the land to possess it. He made a cup with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's called us to be used for his glory to fulfill the promise that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Possess that land. People kept saying, we don't want to. We don't feel like it. The job's too big. It's too strong. The cities are too high. They had all kinds of excuses in the world. Because the people of God, the one thing they don't want to do, they do not want to fight. The people of God today don't want pressure. They don't want to fight. They want confidence. I said last night, we call to carry a cross. Possessing the land is part of carrying that cross. And God never said we will give us a padded cross. Well, Pastor Peter crossed with springs on it. That we can just rest and relax our way into heaven. Amen? The cross is full of thorns and nails and insults and rebukes and, and stripes and beatings and ridicule and mockery. I think we've learned that. Here's who received the rewards. The second chapter of Revelation. Look at what it says very clearly in the seventh verse. I want to say it to you again. We just got through looking at Numbers. 33. That if we let these things in our lives, he said, I'll do to you what I plan to do to them. Seventh verse. Revelation 2, verse 7. God says very clearly, To him who overcomes, I will grant you each of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Are those words also in your Bible? Look at the eleventh verse, the second chapter. To him who overcomes, shall not be hurt by the second death. The second death, of course, as we know, is hell, don't we? The lake of fire. Hell, fire, and brimstone in the lake of fire. Again, in the 17th verse, again God says, To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. That name, by the way, is your new nature, your new character. You overcame the old nature. Whatever God delivered you out of, you're still fighting over coming in some of the afterbirth of it. Because I'll give you a new nature. Again, the Lord says to us very clearly in verse 26. To him who overcomes, and how do you do that? The one that keeps my deeds until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations and is over all the enemies. Amen? And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. Did you catch that? The iron is used for smiting. He, call, he makes the enemy become like clay and powder under our feet. He says, I will give them that authority as I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. And he closed out by saying, he who has an ear, that means a spiritual ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the whole thing God said to the churches is, you better overcome. Possess your land. Overcome. 
Take the land. Possess the land. Take your land. Take the land. Possess it. Possess it. I'll give you authority to possess it. Go in. Amen? One more place. The third chapter. Again, the fifth verse. He overcomes shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I won't erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. What he told us earlier when he was on the earth, if you shed and confess me before man, I'll be shed and confess you before my father and before the mighty angels of God. Is that right? So these are people that are not ashamed to confess him before men. They're not doing with their lip service, folks. They're doing with their lifestyle. Amen? He says in 1 John, the one that confesses that Jesus Christ does not confess that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh. He said that is the spirit of the Antichrist, and there's many Antichrists that go out into the world. You don't do it with your mouth. You do it by with the lifestyle that you live. So when you, when you say, Jesus, come in my life and save me. I live for you. Jesus came in to inhabit our flesh. Does your life say that Jesus is inhabiting your flesh, or is your flesh all under control? He said that's an Antichrist. We're talking with lip service. And so again in the third chapter, the 12th verse, he says, He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. That means he'll make you solid, unmovable, unshakable, unbending, unbowing, strong, firm, like iron, a pillar. And he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write upon him the name of my God, be the same nature that God has. The name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out of heaven for my God, and I'll give him also my new name. Again, he continues in that third chapter, in verse 21. He says in verse 21, this is what he gave to the church of Laodicea that was lukewarm. He said, him who overcomes, he said, overcome that lukewarmness. I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. It's amazing because in Ephesians, he says we will raise up with him and sit with him in heavenly places. What we see in the scripture here, you can't sit with him in heavenly places if you're walking and living a life of compromise and mixture. Amen? Well, if we're slowful, we saw very clearly, and the enemy remains, remains in our land, God will destroy us. Did we just read that? If we don't overcome, God will destroy us. One more place. Revelation 21, verse 7. We're supposed to know this one. What are the things that they're going to inherit? They will inherit it. Sent me this, verse five. He who sits on the throne says, "Behold, I make it all things new." That means everything is in your life that has not become transferred into the kingdom of the light. Everything about your being. Verse six. He says, "I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of the water of life without cost." Well, who gets these things? He tells you in verse seven. He who overcomes shall inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he'll be my son. But for the cowardly, he won't fight. And the fearful, the unbelieving. God has doubt. And the abominable, and the murderers, and the immoral persons. You see, they didn't overcome. And the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and all liars. They'll probably be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So when God saved us, he saved us. So we'll be overcome, isn't he, folks? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. God commands us by the order over and over and over again. He says to us continuously, don't fear. Don't fear the enemy. Don't fear the size of the enemy. Don't even consider meditate on the enemy. Don't consider your past. Don't, make, don't call the things. He said, don't even ponder the things of the past. Did what he told us to do? Meditate on the word of God day and night. Whatever well, things are pure, whatever well, things are just, whatever well, things are right. Is that what he told us? Whatever well, things are honest. There being a virtue, that's the power of God in your life. If you meditate on these things. Amen? Let's look at some of God's commands. He says, don't fight. Excuse me. He says to fight. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Take the land that he, God, has already given and provided for you. Take that salvation that he, God, has already given and provided for you. Overcome because God has already granted you the power to overcome. Amen? Amen. He granted us his son, Jesus. Be of good cheer. I will overcome the world, he said. Let's look at the, the commands of God. Let's go back to the book of Joshua. And look at some of these. Joshua 1, let's begin at verse 5. Joshua 1, verse 5. 
way in the book of Deuteronomy, we saw very clearly a few moments ago, he said, I'll cause the fear of the enemy, of you, to come on the enemy when you step on the land. Is that right? He said, no man will stand before you. Remember him saying that? The first time God ever said that to anybody was to Moses. Now, he says the same thing to Joshua. What he says here. Verse 5. He says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just like I've been with Moses, I will be with you. Why is he with us? To deliver us, to fight for us, and to strengthen us for the battle. Did we learn that? I will not fail you, nor forsake you. God is faithful to his word. He watches his word to perform it, doesn't he, folks? Yeah. Thank God we know he's faithful to his word. Well, back up, please, to verse 3. How do we overcome the land? He says in verse 3, every place that means you try to respect your heart, what's still in your life, what's still reigning there. See the angels still there? You come against it. Lust still there, you come against it. Pride still there, you come against it. Unbelief still there, you come against it. Fear still there, you come against it. Whatever is still working in your life, what's ever there, you're inspecting your own heart. Oh God, you're convicting me of this sin. Lord, it's there. I'm guilty, but I'm coming against it in Jesus' name. He says in verse 3, every place of which the soul of your foot treads. He said, I've given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. Every place. You don't have to worry about it. And be fearful saying, Lord, I don't want to fight against this thing in my life. Every time I try to fight against it, I get whipped. You keep fighting against it. We saw very clearly when the children of Israel began to first fight the war. And all through the book of Judges, we didn't get a chance to look at some of that. Mentally, they lost lots of lives, but they kept fighting. They kept fighting. And God gave them the victory, didn't he, folks? He said, every place where the soul of your foot treads, I've given it to you. Just as I spoke to Moses. Verse 5. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. God's faithful. He says, now here's your part. You be strong and courageous. Jesus said, you take courage. I'm going to become the world. I'm the leader. I'm the overcomer. You're following my steps. You're following my orders. I've already overcome. I'm taking what to do because I've already done it before you did it. I'm the way. Be, be strong and courageous for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do. Again, it's done by obeying all we know to do. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success. That means overcoming. It means cleaving through the righteousness wherever you go. Wherever you go, that means you're taking possession of the land. You go over here for a while, you work on this part of your land. It's your heart. Intro. Amen? Inner thoughts. Inner feelings. Any emotions. He says, when you put your foot on that land, which is your heart, Caribbean, Hebrews 31.30, <laughs> He said, you'll have success wherever your feet goes. Amen? We talk about our feet sharp with the gospel, the preparation of peace, don't we, folks? He said, now here's how you do it. You do it by obeying everything, and here's the other thing. You watch the thought life. He says, you obey, and you watch your thoughts. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. The word meditate means to chew and turn over in the mind over and over. Like a cow chews his cud. So that you may be careful to do. You say, well, do I just can't seem to obey your word? He said, oh, you meditate on my word day and night? That's why we tell you to buy the tapes and play them over and over and over until, the, until they become raggedy. But you may be careful to do according to all that's written, for then you'll make your way possible. He says, then you will make your way. All of a sudden, your ways begin to change. Then you'll make your way prosperous. That means prosperous to overcome, cleaving through and pressing through rocks, mountains to righteousness. He said, haven't I commanded you to be strong and courageous? Don't tremble or be dismayed. How are we strong and courageous? The word of God continue to come out of my mouth. David said, our best Lord of all times, his praise shall continue to be in my mouth. The word's always coming out. No matter if he's in a pit, as we saw earlier, or in a high place, as we saw earlier, or in a desert place, as we saw earlier. 
or a dry place, as we saw earlier, he's always praising God. He continues to fight with the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, doesn't he? For the Lord is with you wherever you go. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Well, we saw it happen. Let's see what happens. Joshua obeys. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the midst of the camp, and command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourself for within three days. You're to cross this Jordan to go in and possess the land. They knew they were going to get to walk with it. They had one purpose, to possess the land. Which Lord your God has given you to possess it, and to the Reubenites, and the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God gives you rest, and will give you this land. Your wives, your little boys, your cows shall remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan, but you shall cross before your brothers in battle array. Notice again. The same way they begin this journey is how they also continue to, to take the land. When they first came out of Egypt, led by Moses, the Bible says they went up and marched away. They were dressed for battle. It's amazing they never wanted to fight. All your valiant warriors, the fight means you're strong and courageous, and shall help them. Until the Lord gives your brother rest, and he gives us why we to help one another. See, in the area of our lives, we try to go to one another and say, listen, brother, I come and help you with something. These men were called to be helpers, to make sure that they overcame. He goes on to say, you do this until the Lord gives your brothers rest, as he gives you, and they will also possess the language the Lord your God has given them. Then you shall return to your own land and possess that which Moses, servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan before the sun set. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that you command us we will do, and whatever you send us we will go, just as we obeyed Moses in all things. So we will also obey you, only may the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey your words, all that you command them, to be put to death, he said, you make sure you be only be strong and courageous. Is that right? And we know that he gave him the land that he folks. Hallelujah. But God is always with us to do what? To save us always and to strengthen us for the warfare. Let's go back to Psalms 84 and look at some of these scriptures. Psalms 84. see something. I'm going to say it to you again, people. You can always tell when there's no life among the body, the body of Christ. There's no praise. There's no worship. There's no noise. You notice the point of it. The sound. There's a sound. A joyful shouting and salvation in the dwelling of the righteous. Is that right? Yes. Well, watch what you're about to read here. Psalm 84 verse 5. How blessed is the man. Well, let's go to verse 4. How blessed are those who dwell in, there in thy house. What are they doing? They're ever doing what? Praising thee. I wish our praise would pick up about nine echelons. I mean that. But what is this person doing? He's got something in him. How blessed is he whose strength is in thee, and whose heart are the highways to Zion. That's overcoming church, isn't it? Passing through the valley of Baca. Do this. Just like we spread over there a while ago. In a high place, you're fighting. A low place, a pit, you're fighting. In a desert place, you're fighting. In the Arava, you're fighting. No matter if you're in a place of victory, you're still fighting. It's the same thing here. They pass through a hard place, Baca. Place of hardship and bitterness. They make it a spring. That means a place of life. Water. Living water. Spring. How? Huh. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. God gives them more strength. How does it happen? Every one of them appears before God in Zion. Are those words all speaking of the Bible? Now, folks, when you say you're coming from my presence, you come with what? Praise and thanksgiving. Otherwise, God does not accept your appearance before him. In Psalms 18, Look what it says in the first verse. Psalms 18, verse 1. Here again we read. Oh, this 18 Psalms, folks, is awesome. He says, I love thee, O Lord, my strength. 
The Lord is my rock, that means place of security. And my fortress, place of protection. My deliverer, the one that fights for it. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield, God totally protects him. And the horn of my salvation, the strength of his salvation. My stronghold, where he hides out from the enemy. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Well, David, what did you have to pass through? David, I mean, after all, God even praised you, David. He said he was a man after his own heart, David. I'm sure, David, you had to be somebody special. Surely you didn't have to fight like we're called to fight, did you? David helps us. The what he says in the fourth verse. He said, the cards of death encompass me. Notice, he kept fighting, didn't he? And the terrors of ungodliness terrified me. The cards of Sheol that's hell surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. Would you say he's in a desert place or in a low place or in a pit? Or in a hard place? Talk to me. Amen. He says, what did you do, David? Here's how you fall. He says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried to my God for help. I want your strength, Lord. The battle's too much for me, Lord. He heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry for help before him came into his ears. Oh, glory. It's not like he got his prayer answered. Is that right? Look at verse 16. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy. And from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my stay. I believe he believes what he said. God's his rock. He, wasn't, he didn't move, did he? He brought me forth also into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Bible says God delights in all who take refuge in him. He says not one of them will be disappointed. Amen? Well, let's skip on down and see something else he says. Look what he says very clearly in verse 30. He says, as for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. How many? All, 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 all. For who is God but the Lord? And who's a rock except our God? But God who girds me with strength. He makes my way blameless. He makes my feet like hinds feet. That means there's not an obstacle that can stand before us. That God does not give us the power and the strength to trample under our feet. Mountains, trample them under your feet. Grind them to dust and powder. Let's see what we're talking about. He sets me upon my high places. He trains my hands for battle. All the discipline we were getting was for warfare. All the teaching we've been exposed to was for warfare. Training us for battle. What's the fight we fight? We fight the good fight of faith. So that my arms can bend up of bronze. That's all the judgment of hell coming against us. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand upholds me, and thy gentleness makes me great. Thou dost enlarge my steps under me, and my feet have not slipped. But let's look at this grinding of power. I pursued my enemies. Notice, he ain't running from the enemy. The enemy is running from him. We saw the same characteristic through this entire six weeks. We start off the book of Joshua. Amen? And he says, I did not turn back because he didn't stop and rest and say, well, I've chased him this far. I'm tired. No. He says, I didn't turn back until they were consumed. Is it, are those words in your Bible? Amen. When you fight against the powers of hell in your life, is that the attitude you have? If you have any other attitude, you have the attitude of those that will soon be crushed under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if your attitude is, I'm not going to stop until I have the victory in this area of my life, let me tell you something. You're an overcomer. You're taking the land. He said, I pursued my enemies and overtook them. And I did not turn back until they were consumed. Overtook them means he trampled them under his feet. I shot at them so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength. For what purpose? For battle. The battle. Everybody says, oh, you pray my strength in the Lord. Why? You ain't fighting. 
God only gives strength for battle. And thou hast to do unto me those who rose up against me. Thou hast also made my enemies run for me. That's what it means. Turn their backs to me, he says. That means you made the enemy run for me, Lord. And I destroyed those who hated me. They cried for help. But that was none to save them. I can hear him. Oh, Satan, send more demon powers. Help us. That was none to save them. But the demon in all of hell could stop you once you came against them. Even to the Lord. How they cried to the Lord. Lord, Lord, look how many times they failed you, Lord. Lord, Lord, don't, don't do that for them. Lord, they failed you that many times, Lord. Look what God says about it. See, once you get in that mentality, I'm, I'm going to go until they're destroyed. They cried to God, but he didn't answer them. What would you do, David? He said, I beat them fine as a dust before the wind. I entered them out as the mire of the streets. What's the words in your Bible? Amen. Does it sound like to you that David's running from the enemy? Or does it sound like the enemy's running from David? Amen. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> Look what he says in verse 29. He said, for by thee I can run upon a troop. I'll take on the whole lot of devils, he's saying. For by my God I can leap over a wall. Nothing can stop it. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Look at 2 Samuel, 22nd chapter. 2 Samuel, 22nd chapter. We have been given the victory, folks, whether you believe it or not. Let me say it again. We all have been given the victory, whether you accept it or not. If you don't accept it, you'll be trampled on his feet. Second Samuel 22. Look at verse 40 and 41. Again, we got the same thing. For thou hast given me with strength for what purpose? Yeah. The Bible. Thou hast subdued unto me those who rose up against me. Thou hast also made my enemies turn their backs to me. I destroyed those who hated me. Folks, are those words also in your Bible? Amen. In Psalms 46, let's go back to the book of Psalms. Psalms 46. Psalms 46. Let's see the first five verses. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help. Wait a minute. A very what? Present. Oh, that means he must be right here. That must mean he hasn't left us or forsaken us. When is he there? In trouble. Who's in trouble? God knows when you're in trouble. Here's the attitude of the overcomer. Oh, these words are awesome. Therefore, that means summing up what's written above. I'll tell you what's amazing about this verse. God made a statement and then goes into summing it up for us. Made one little verse statement and now he sums it up. He says, this should be your attitude. Once you accept the fact, I'm with you to deliver you, to fight for you, to strengthen you for battle. Therefore, we will not fear. Oh, notice that. Well, the earth should change. Though its mountains slip into the harbor sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, we're not going to fear. Why? you got a different stream running through you. There is a river, he says, whose streams make glad the city of God. You and I are supposed to be the city of God. The holy dwelling places of the Most High. I mean, God dwells with you. He hasn't left you, has he? God is in the midst of her. She won't be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms taught him. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Again, he says in verse 11. Let's go to verse 10. He says, look, stop your stupid striving. Stop all your games of worry and doubting. And wondering, how am I going to do it? Let me help you. You can't do it. God's going to do it for us. Amen. To 
It's time you stop pondering, he says, what the end is going to do. If you see striving and know that I'm God, and I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted the earth. And David closed out by saying, the God of hosts, he's with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Amen? Amen. In Psalm 37, look what he says in verse 39 and verse 40. Psalm 37, verse 39 and verse 40. But the salvation of the righteous, verse 39, is from the Lord. He is their strength. Here it is again. When are you all strength, Lord? In time of trouble. Say with me. I'm an overcomer. Because God's with me. To deliver me. To strengthen me. To save me. And to help me. And to rescue me. When is our help? In time of trouble. And what it says about the faithfulness of God, you're going to put a big faithfulness around verse 40. And the Lord helps them. Did he promise to help us? And delivers them. Did he promise to deliver us? He delivers them from the wicked and saves them. Why? Because they take refuge in him, which means they put their faith in him. In Psalms 55. Look what it says in verse 18. He will redeem my soul in peace from the battle which is against me, for they are many who strive with me. Folks, are those words also in your Bible? Amen. Are you in a battle? Yes. You're supposed to be. You're called to be a soldier. Let's look at Psalm 68 and look at verse 35. Psalm 68, verse 35. Here again, the Lord writes. I'll tell us, dude. Let's just begin at verse 32 because I'm taking something, folks. Listen to me. If it's not normal and natural to be singing and praising God at all times, folks, not in the battle. If you wonder why, how could, was it, Paul and Silas sing songs and songs at midnight and all the prisoners listening to them when they've been beaten so horribly and thrown into a dungeon? Because folks, they knew that God was with them. And there's, there's a sound in the camp of those that believe God. It's found a sound of joyful shouting of salvation in the dwelling of the righteous. There's a, no, there's a noise in the war camp. That noise is praising God continually. That's what he says. Sing to God, O King of the earth. Verse 32. Sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides upon the highest heavens, which are from ancient times. Behold, he speaks forth with his voice, a mighty voice. A scribe strip to God. What does that mean? Oh God, hallelujah. I'm in a pit, Lord. I'm in a hard place, Lord. I'm in your fiery judgments, Lord. But oh, I worship you and my strength, my faith in you, Lord. You will deliver me, Lord. You're with me to deliver me and to save me, Lord. You're with me to rescue me. God, you're my hiding place. You're my stronghold. You're my rock. You're my salvation. Ascribe strength to him. And tell you to worry about your own weakness or strength. He told, told Paul, stop wasting your prayers to me. My grace is enough for you. So Paul went on to say, he said, I would rather boast about my weakness because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Ascribe strength to God. His majesty is over Israel. The Bible says Israel, those that's pure in heart. <laughs> and his strength is in the skies. It means the heavens of heavens. Oh God, thou art awesome for my sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives what? Strength and what? Power. That means power to overcome. Strength to overcome. Strength to win the war. Power to destroy the enemy. The God of Israel himself, personally, gives strength and power to the people. He says, blessed be God. Are those words in your Bible? Amen. Now let's begin to close this out. 
because we made up our minds we'll be overcomers. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go back to the book of the New Testament. Let's begin to look at this war in Timothy. Let's go there, please. Second Timothy. He's talking about where he puts his faith. Paul is one of those old warriors when he writes this young Timothy. And he writes this so that Timothy won't become discouraged. He writes this so Timothy can know where to put his faith. And he says in the first verse, You therefore, my son, the same exact word we saw that God told Joshua. That God says continually, be strong. Being fearful is opposite of being strong. Doubting is opposite of being strong. Where do you put your faith? Tell me where you put your faith. You be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And the things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, you teach the same word of obedience and the word to be obeyed like I did, Timothy. These entrust a faithful man who also have faith full in God who will be able to teach others also. He's talking about teaching about warfare. He says to them, look, Timothy, you suffer a hardship with me as a good soldier. A sorry soldier is one that complains about the hardship. A cowardly soldier is one that's always trying to find a way to get out of the war. You see, this, this, that soldier keeps looking for this paddy cross with springs. Apostle Peter Cross. And God says to him, You suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Oh, now we understand it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the army of the Lord. It's the war camp of Jesus Christ. The overcomer. And then he warns Timothy. He says, No soldier in active service. Active, which means he's a doer. Not just a hero. Entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. Entangles himself means he's always worrying about this world and things and everything else you can think about. He's entangled. His heart's entangled. That's what's entangled. His heart. Why? So that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. And in verse 5 he tells him, you compete according to rules. We need to see what God's rules are, don't we, folks? Because we're called to be overcomers. Is he getting hot in here? Okay. Where are we going from an iceberg today to the Sahara Desert? Right? <laughs> One brother's feet was like icebergs. Now they're like toast. <laughs> well, bless God. Let's see what the rules are. Can we look at the rules? We're going to close with the rules. Two more places. Or three. Let's go first and see what the Lord says to us about us being strong. In, in Ephesians, we see that same command, take the land, be strong. Take the land, be strong. Ephesians 6, he says to us very clearly, finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, he sums up everything for the overcomer. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The schemes of the devil is to wage war with us and overcome us. Is that right? Amen. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world force of this, this darkness, against the spiritual force of wickedness in the heavenly places, Therefore, you take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, that means everything that you know that God told you to do, he said to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. That means the abiding word of God is in your heart, ruling and reigning. Your loins is the strongest part of your body. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, that means not walking in your own righteousness, but you're walking that righteousness which is by faith that's in Christ Jesus. 
and having shod your feet with a prepare preparation, preparation, prepare to overcome of the gospel of peace. He says, additional, you take that shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish not a few of them, all A L L, the flaming missiles of the evil one. It's amazing he would address that, and we can put it almost last. You take the helmet of salvation. By the way, the flaming missiles and the helmet of salvation go together. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, you be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Is that in your Bible? Amen. You fight for yourself and you also fight for your brothers, the ones that can listen to you. Well, let me just close with one more scripture. Because we are called to be overcomers. Amen? Amen. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, please. Now, he talked about the flaming missiles. The moment that we take in one of the flaming missiles, we're on our way to destruction. The flaming missiles, the thoughts that Satan constantly bombards with and badger us with about this world, about sin, about evil, about darkness, about insecurity, about fear, about dread. Thoughts. And once we start finding our lives ruled by some thought of doubt, of fear, of dread, of insecurity, of fear, we've been hitting one of the flaming missiles. And he made a statement. He talked about a shield of faith. He talked about the word of God. The Lord told Joshua, this book of all should not depart from your mouth the word of God. He said to us, every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. He said, your vindication, your acquittal is for me. This is the heritage of the children of God. You take the word of God. Then he talked about a helmet of salvation, the mind of Christ, thinking only God's thoughts. Amen? He says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, he said, let us know that this whole camp of the earth is, is the wall plain, the wall ground. The wall ground is our minds, our thoughts, our imaginations. We don't walk according to the flesh that we want to overcome. For the weapons of our warfare now, the flesh, these weapons are what we're looking at. But they're divinely powerful. In other words, they're all of God for the destruction of fortresses. And we're destroying speculation. That's the thought of life. That's your heaven of salvation. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, knowing that God's with you to save you, to deliver you, to fight for you, to strengthen you for the battle. And we are taking every thought captive. It means casting down to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. And he tells them, you are looking at things as they are outwardly. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let me close it with Philippians. You what Paul said to us again. And these instructions was for us to overcome and it's on the path of the overcomer. Amen? It's the book of Philippians. And again, he says in the third verse, the third chapter, excuse me, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. It's almost like what David always said, wasn't it? Notice that, notice that, that stream seems to run among the war cap of God. There's rejoicing and shouting and salvation. Amen? Amen. And in rejoicing in the Lord, he talks about part of our rejoicing. He goes on to say very clearly, verse 13, Brethren, I don't regret myself as having laid hold of it yet. I haven't overcome yet, he's saying. But there's one thing I do. It's the law of his life. I forget what lies behind. I'm reaching forward to what lies ahead. It's eternal life. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the other call of God that's in Christ Jesus. And that as therefore as many as are perfect, circle so perfect, put overcomers, overcomers, have this attitude. It's the attitude of the overcomer. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Amen? Amen. And then he tells us about the minds, the thought life, 
the mind. And he says to us very clearly, verse chapter 4, verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. We see also that prayer is one of the weapons of our warfare. Amen? Supplication is deep crying out to God, deep groanings. There's some place in this warfare that prayer alone, a light prayer is not enough. It comes when we literally groaning and agonizing under God. That's putting your faith in our rock and our refuge, our, our strong tower, our fortress. Amen? Amen? With thanksgiving, that means the whole time you're crying out and even groaning, there's that current of worship. There's thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. There's a still worship of him, praise of him, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known of God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts. Notice that. There's that righteousness. There's that breastplate. It's guarding your heart. And also your minds. There's a heaven of salvation in Christ Jesus. And he sums it up. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report or repute, that means report, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The same thing we read in Joshua 1. This book of the law shall not depart from your what? Mouth, but you shall do what to it? Meditate on it day and night. Can you say amen? amen? Well, Father, we thank you for this six weeks. We are more determined than ever to be overcomers of all things, in all things, through all things. We are determined more than ever to be praisers of you. Hold glory to your name. Those who absolutely and totally put their faith in you without turning back. And Lord, we thank you for the victory you've given us over the enemy. We claim that victory right now that you've given us over the enemy. We stop what we've been going through. We stop looking at it. We stop meditating on what we've been going through. But Lord, we put our minds tonight in a higher plane. In the plane of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We bind every principality, every power of hell, of darkness. That's waging war against our souls and our minds and our hearts. And this night, Lord, we want you to know we're taking the land because you told us to in Jesus' name. And Lord, we know that you're with us to strengthen us. For battle, for warfare. God, we cry out for this strength. Oh, God, strengthen out our hands for war. Strengthen our minds for war. Give us a war of mind mentality. Not to fight this war in our own strength. We made our mind, Lord, to cease striving to know that you're God. And that all who put that trust in you is never disappointed. Father God, we refuse to bow anymore. We refuse to bend anymore. And Lord, you said when we done all we're going to do to keep standing. You told us, oh God, to stand still and see the salvation of God. You said, Lord, we don't grumble and complain, you'll fight for us. Oh, Baba make us stay and be kept on the path of, of the overcomer. You said, the one that overcomes will inherit all things. Father God, we renounce how we've walked up to this time before we took this course, this six weeks. Father God, we ask you to ingrain this word of our hearts, our minds, even into our consciousness. That, Lord, that we'll begin to do our part to meditate on what we've learned this six weeks. Not to lose it. Not to give it up like the other things we've given up because of doubt and fear and dread and unbelief. We renounce it's over in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we thank you for making our feet like hinds' feet. And we take the victory. We take that, that which you've so freely given to us. And, Lord, you said, how shall you not with him also freely give us all things, these things that pertain to life and godliness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying for us and thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for opening our heart to our understanding. Lord, we, re- we receive what we've heard this six weeks. Keep it in our heart stored up. Lord, kindle it alive in the heart to the of God. Stir it up in us when we need it, oh God. Lord, we've made our minds. If we're in a pit, we're going to keep fighting. If we're in the highest place of heaven, Enjoying peace and absolute victory and an anointing, we're going to keep fighting. If we're in a dry place, Lord, we're going to keep fighting. If we're in a desert place, we're going to keep fighting. Striven us, O oh God, for this battle to overcome the enemy. We ask it, Father God, in Jesus' name. We receive the power of his blood 
and the power is poured out life. That our sins be trampled under your feet, Father. Don't trample us. That our sins be trampled under your feet. We ask it in Jesus' name. Can everybody say amen, please? Amen. Well, praise God, we're dismissed. <coughs>